This is emetropization visually guided growth for V551 ocular motility and refraction. Emetropization. Emetropization is the process by which eyes grow to minimize refractive error and maximize visual acuity from birth throughout childhood. It's a very conserved process across multiple different species, including mammals, birds, and reptiles, and fish. Essentially, at birth, the eye has no idea what position is optically focused correctly, so there's a wide range of possibilities. It's relatively shorter than average. Once as vision starts to occur at birth, when the eyes open and light starts to enter the eyes, the eyes start to grow to optimize their vision and minimize refractive error. And this is throughout childhood. There is a fast growing period during the first three years of human life or the early parts of animals' lives. And there's a slow period from three to, to nine years old where it finishes completing itself through emetropization. So how do we know a lot about emetropization? Well, and how do we know that the eyes need visual input to grow to the proper, proper place? Well, that first came about by dark rearing. What that means is we, we stick an animal into a dark environment and they could have a cycle of 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark. They could have 24 hours of light, or they could have just complete darkness, 24 hours. So we look at an animal at the start of their birth, and this is in cases in mice, they're relatively one refractive error. Without light whatsoever though, what happens is the eyes become more and more hyperopic. They grow less and less. They're shorter essentially. With light, however, they start to approach essentially zero refractive error or emetropia. Again, without light, the eyes become hyperopic. Light is a necessary component for proper emetropization. Well, is it just the light itself or is there something about the light that is a critical to that development? And that's where form deprivation comes in. These experiments were initially done for amblyopia, but the concept is using an occluder or some sort of device that still allows light into the eye, but doesn't give you any details about what the image is. In this case, a piece of plastic diffuses the light and it's put over a guinea pig's eye, and the other eye is usually left unoccluded to check the normal vision. So what's gonna happen to the refractive error when we still allow light into the eye, but we don't give them the details that they see. They don't see letters of ease, they don't see their food, they can't see anything else, they just have light coming in. What happens to the eye's refractive error in that process? And it doesn't really matter the animal, this has been repeated across wide ranges of animals. What we see is if you get light into the eye, but it has no structure, it has no image to it, it has no letter E details, it has no leaf details, it has no picture to it, the eyes become myopic compared to if they're given a normal view, they'll be relatively emetropic. They will try and approach zero diopters of refractive error. Now you might ask a question, how do we know this in humans? We weren't crazy enough to put a ping pong ball or something over a little baby's eye to check this, but we know what happens in humans too. And that's because the eyes in humans sometimes actually have form deprivation naturally. And that's in the form of congenital cataracts. Here we have a kid, a little a young child, a baby that has a cataract in that right eye as we look at it. And that causes form deprivation as well, where light en still enters the eye, but it gets scattered about because of the cataract. They don't have a clear image to focus because there's no image at all, it's being destroyed. Well, what happens when we see with their refractive error? The eye that has the congenital cataract will also develop far more myopia or grow longer than if it had normal natural vision that was unoccluded in any way, form, shape or form. This means the eyes need light with image content, like contrast, or i.e. you can think about it as something to see. It can't just be light by itself, it has to have details to it. Well, so now we know it needs details. Well, we know defocus or refractive error can, or, or change in your prescription can alter those details by making it blurry. So that's when we, they started looking at lens experiments for refractive development. And this is well known in lots of animal models, but essentially what we, they did next was added different lenses in front of the animal's eyes. If you added a plus lens, that would give the eye too much power so it would focus the image in front of the retina. 
If you give them a negative lens, it would decrease the power and focus the image behind the retina. So what happens to refractive error and to eye growth when these are done? Well, when you give a myopic defocus, you focus the image in front of the retina, the eyes on these animals actually shorten or actually slow their growth to match that focus. So the eye is actively trying to find the best focal position for itself during development to optimize vision. Likewise, if you use a hyperopic defocus or a negative lens, too much negative lens, the image is focused behind the retina. And what happens there is the eyes then elongate. They become larger and longer to try and find that focal position that they, to improve their vision. And this again is true of every animal, it's model that's been used on over time. It's been done in fish, dogs, it's been done in reptiles, it's been done in tree shrews, primates, chickens, and it's been done in humans, which we will get into later on. And this isn't even recent research. This research has been well established for the past 35 years. This was the first reported instance of using animal models to induce refractive changes, both myopic and hyperopic. Ultimately, though, this is interrupting the process of emetropization. Through, our, through research, we also know the growth to the focus is controlled in the eye, not in the brain. How do we know that? Well, we've taken animal models where we've removed the input from the brain. So they will cut the optic nerve, they'll cut the ciliary nerve, so that the brain can't send any, any signals one way or the other to the eye. And then they'll do those same lens experiments or form deprivation experiments to see what happens. And what ultimately happens always is the eye still responds to those defocus signals, even in spite of the nerve being cut and no input from the brain. So what does that mean? We know that local retina controls emetropization and the growth to optimize refraction. This is not a brain process, it's an, a retinal eye process. And this process is even more localized than just the retina itself. It's localized to individual little areas of the retina. One of the ways we know that is through experiments where they no longer deprive just the whole eye, but just a little section of the eye. Here on the bottom, we can see where they've actually occluded just a small section of the retina using a form depriver. The other half of the field is totally normal, so it has normal natural vision. What happens with the eye growth in that situation? The eyes that are occluded and have the form deprivation grow longer, just as you'd expect, but the areas that with normal vision stay at the, their normal spot. That means the retina is controlled at a very local level across it and not just some sort of global change of the entire eye. And lastly, logically you would think that the fovea with its high impact of cells would be the primary driver of that, but that turns out not to be the case. Emetropization is not controlled by the fovea. How do we know that, you might ask next? Well, they've taken examples where they've induced defocus, just like all these other experiments we've shown you, and they've either destroyed, it has destroyed the phobia with a laser in one eye and let the other eye normally have clear vision. Well, what happens to the refractive error when this is done? It doesn't matter if you have a phobia or you don't have a phobia, the eyes emetropize and reach their normal position regardless of whether the eye was had a normal phobia or not. That means the phobia is not required for normal emetropization. Well, you might ask a simple question, why do optometry students need to know about emetropization? Well, first of all, you're gonna be the experts in your communities on all things refraction and refractive error. So you should definitely know how the eye controls itself as far as refractive error goes. Secondly though, and more importantly, this should give you an instinct on what to do with patients. Giving the wrong RX, especially to children, can permanently alter their prescriptions. If too much minus is given to a child, the focal position will be placed behind the retina. What will happen then is the eye will elongate permanently. This is also true, but reverse for too much plus. If you place the image in front of the retina, it will inhibit growth and the eye will be shorter. You might ask, why does that matter? And the answer why it matters is, with myopia comes other diseases. Any change in axial length is going to stretch the eye and it's gonna change things and interact with retinal disease and other ocular diseases. 
So with increasing levels of myopia, as an example, in increases your risk for things like retinal detachment, maculopathies. It might affect some things like cataracts and glaucoma. So we have an ob obligation to not increase people's myopia by the prescriptions we give. Now, I know a lot of you guys like retinal disease, and this might be your most exciting part. There'll be much more later in the semester on how refractive air interacts with ocular disease and how ocular disease can change refractive air. Now, unfortunately, though, we do know that this can happen in real people because researchers experimentally did it in children. Uh, this would be totally unethical in today's standards, and it initially wasn't done to induce myopia or hyperopia. It was initially done to treat an accommodative disorder. But researchers intentionally put too much plus in one eye of a child and left the other eye normally focused. And the exact results that we would expect from animal models happen in human models. If you gave too much plus, the eye was much shorter and the refractive error was much less. Conversely, the eye that didn't have that was a longer eye with more, with, with more myopia or less hyperopia. And so this, while unethical, proves that we should definitely not over plus or under minus, especially children. Now, when we get to adults, we discuss things like their vision and their habitual prescriptions, and that comes in our prescribing step, which we'll get into later in the class. Thank you.